Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and it's time to Balrog and Roll as we are now at the finale for Rings of Power Season 1. The Lord of the Rings show answers a lot of questions in its last episode, and throughout this video we're going to be breaking down what happens, what it means for the future, and also giving our review on the series as a whole. Full spoilers from here on out, so if you don't want anything ruined then I recommend that you head out now. Please hit the thumbs up button if you think the video is precious, and make sure you subscribe but uh, vid breakdowns that you'll be Galadriel you stuck around for. Even the puns are <laughs> Anyway, with that out of the way, huge thank you for clicking this. Now let's get into Rings of Power Episode 8. Now last week saw the aftermath of the birth of Mount Doom, which completely ravaged the Southlands. Normally I'd say, one does not simply change the text of the Southlands into Mordor, but after Adar took over the realm, it became his. Meriol decided to return to Numenor in order to gather more forces, and both Galadriel and Halbrand travelled out together. The Harfoot set out looking for the stranger in order to warn him he was being tracked by Feminem and the people who played Stan and Kim in the music videos. Lastly was Jiren who told Elrond and his son to leave the digging, and he accidentally awakened a Balrog whilst refusing to help the elves. Now that should be a fully caught up, and this entry picks up with the stranger. We get a strong focus on his eye, similar to how last week started with Galadriel. Here he is in Elan Galen, which is known as the Greenwood, and once the shadow of Dol Guedos spread, this became known as Mirkwood. He finds the apple that Nori gave him last week, but he drops it, only for it to be picked up by what seems to be her. However, it's a trap. and we see the Dweller is here. They say they're there to serve Sauron, but we'll, we'll get into it. Now over at Aregion, Galadriel arrives with Halbran for the elves to heal him. He ends up wandering through Celebrimbor's workshop, and I was sitting there like, you mother f <laughs> They discuss the essence of Valinor being trapped by Feanor. He's described as having a distinct personality flaw in that he possessed too much pride, and though he was highly skilled, this need to be marveled led to the creation of several things that spelled doom for his people. As for the rings, a lot of them were made by the grandson of Feanor, with Celebrimbor handling the greatest of the three. In total, 19 were created, with 16 being the ones that Sauron also had a hand in. These were given as gifts, with Sauron planning to use them as a way to bring those that wore them under his sway. Sauron crafted the One Ring himself, and when he put it on, the elves instantly became aware of what was going on. They hid most of them and passed some onto the dwarves, though Sauron gained 15 back and he then passed them out. He gave 9 to the men, knowing that they would be the easiest to manipulate, and the wearers ended up becoming the ringwraiths. He gave six to the dwarves who became very wealthy, but they weren't swayed by Sauron due to their tough spirits. They did however become greedier because of them, which eventually led to their downfall anyway. They of course brought with them the extended life which wasn't originally planned by Sauron, as he wanted to give them solely to the elves who were already immortal. Now it is important to bear in mind that an additional ring was given at khazad so in total the dwarves had seven. The remaining three stayed with the elves, and we get a strong focus on them when the episode comes to fruition. They weren't created in order for the elves to conquer, and instead they were used for healing, understanding, and also creation. The episode is called Alloyed, tying in with how alloys are used to create them, and without Sauron's input, they never would have been made. Halbrand calls this knowledge a gift, and this is the first major clue that he's in fact the big bad. Celebrimbor initially pitches the idea of a crown made for Gilgalad, but of course, they end up making the rings, which also holds the jewels. Once more, there's mention of the Unseen World, which we know from the first episode that Sauron was experimenting with. Gil-galad is the only one who sees how dangerous it could be, and he instructs that they all go back to Linden. Celebrimbor has clearly been manipulated by Halbrand, and Galadriel starts to suspect something is off as the episode goes on. Now the reveal that Halbrand is Sauron is something we've talked about a lot in theory time, theory time, theory time. and whilst we've often said that we don't think it's the case, this is mainly because of how obvious it was to the point that I honestly thought it was a red herring. My money was on Disa with her turning into Sauron and then saying suck Disa nuts, but you can't win them all, and looking back there were several clues laced throughout the series that gave away the Halbrand twist. When he first met Galadriel, he warned her about how appearances could be deceptive. Upon being taken to Numenor, he was extremely interested in the forge, and he constantly pushed his way in to trying to be a smith. There was also the whispering in Farazone's ears. Sauron in the book is someone who manipulated the character, and this was referred to as whispering, so a subtext. Now he's often hinted at his dark past, and he clearly had crossed paths with Adar before. 
Now, Adar stated that he had killed Sauron, and though Halbrand recognised him, Adar didn't recognise Halbrand. He refused to answer who he was when he was asked to leave the barn, and there was a lot of ambiguity about the character's past. Now, this also kind of ties back to Gil-galad, who warned in episode 1 that if Galadriel stuck around, then darkness would return to the land. She, of course, helped Halbrand sail back to the point he was discovered by the men of Numenor, and as I've been saying for ages, it's all connected. Now, in the source material, Sauron shapeshifted into the form of Anatar, who was known as the Lord of Gifts. He appeared angelic and went to Celebrimbor and his elven smiths, offering them the knowledge and material to bring about the creation of the rings. Halbrand is a different form to this, with him seemingly being a cast-out king of the Southlands, similar to how Aragorn would be down the line. None of the Southlanders knew who he was, and they simply took his word for it, once more showing how he manipulated his way in. Galadriel is all like, You dirty rat! You killed my brother! And though Caliborn was thought to be slain too, we do know that he's still alive due to him popping up later in the timeline. Sauron is said to have come from the shadows, and I think they deliberately did the celestial event with a stranger in his eye to misdirect us into thinking he was the character. However, for the series, he rose once more from the sea and got revenge on the one who wronged him in a door. Let me know what you think of the Halbrand twist below and where you think they're going to go with the character in the future. Obviously, the people of the Southlands still think that he's their king, so I can see him using them as a way to combat Adar's forces. Kind of bad by Galadriel to not at least send a warning to them that Halbrand is the Dark Lord, uh, yeah, and they're likely going to fall under his rule and probably be corrupted by him. Cut back to Numenor, and we see Aerion being tasked by Farazhan to capture the likeness of the king before he passes away. After being the second dying king this week that mistook a woman at his bedside for someone else, she travels out to the Palantir. The king warns her about the fall of Numenor, which is likely an event the second season will focus around. This was more about the little pieces that came together for the creation of the rings, so I can see season 2 having that as a pivotal point. We never learn what happens with the Plantier, and also a sealed door is a plot point that's dropped. However, his horse went off the leash last week, and I can see it being a similar situation to what happened with Aragorn in the Two Towers. Beric ended up finding him, and I'm guessing that the same thing's gonna happen with your boy. On top of this, we never have resolution to the Balrog thing either, and it all kind of felt like a missed opportunity for a season finale. Either way, Elrond drops the line, Hope is never mere. Not even when it is meager. Which is something that Gil Galad said in episode 1. The clip keeps getting flagged and the video keeps getting blocked, so here it is over a still image. Hope is never mere, Elrond. Even when it is meager. Now from here we could disown non blondes. F hell. That's that's the worst one ever. Uh, they explain the Hermit Hat Star constellation. This can only be spotted in Rune, and they start to basically make him feel like I do when people start to gas me up that I'm better at breakdowns than Doug is. No one is though, mate. I'm not getting gassed on this. Honestly, I felt it was a mistake doing the gifts line from Halbrand earlier, as it kind of ruined any tension due to it now being clearly him that was Sauron and not the stranger. They kind of played their hand on this by giving us the reveal earlier, and it was a similar thing with the Mordor change, where the audience was ahead of the show and waiting for it to catch up to them. Now we see that the Harfoots have snuck in using ghillie suits from Call of Duty, and they go to rescue him. However, it's a trap! But the stranger ends up saving his friends after a battle with the three. I really like the way this was presented, and the effect work on it, with the stones and environment floating around that worked really well in my opinion. Elements of it kind of rift on the breakdance fight from the Fellowship, with the Harfoots showing their strength of character in taking a stand against far more powerful beings. Throughout these breakdowns, we've talked about how the Stranger needed a staff to harness his powers, and this is presented to him in the form of Nori giving him the Dwellers. Had me imagining a What if world where the Stranger gets to become Sauron, and he ends up delivering a speech riffing on the one that he dropped to the Balrog. He mentions sending them back to the shadows, and also reveals another form of them in which they appear like white figures. This is similar to how the ring wraiths did when Frodo put on the ring, and they realise he's not the stranger, and call him an Eastar. Though we don't get it confirmed, it is heavily hinted at that the stranger is Gandalf for a number of reasons. They play slightly loose with it, and have him dropping a line similar to what Gandalf did in the Fellowship of the Rings. When in doubt, Eleanor Brandyfoot. Always follow your nose. This is a play on. If you die, you're not. Always follow your nose. This changes things from the book, as originally the Blue Wizards came to Middle Earth first, and then Gandalf didn't arrive until much later in the timeline. He also came from the sea, whereas he drops down through a meteor. 
I've been rewatching the Peter Jackson trilogy in preparation for this show, and there are several lines that give us hints towards the stranger being Gandalf. Firstly was his love for the halflings, which the show is now telling us developed due to his relationship with the Halffoots. There's also one of his many nicknames. When Gandalf is resurrected as the White Wizard, he recounts some of the things that he was called in the past, and tells Aragorn that he was named the Grey Pilgrim. The stranger, of course, wears all grey, and even the beard and hair he carries are similar to Gandalf. The Istari were ageless, but they all appeared as elderly men so that they come across unassuming and frail to those that face them. This wasn't the case, and just like things were with Sauron, appearances could be deceptive. This was a pretty obvious twist, so no prizes for getting it right, and it was made even more obvious by the fact Amazon kept the character's name a secret. Had it just been a normal wizard, I guess they would have let us know in advance, but still, the stranger is one of the stronger characters in the series. I'm glad to see them, including Gandalf with him. You suck! Sadok sadly dies, which is Sadok, and the long and winding road ends for our traveller here. Whereas the Harfoots used to abandon people to die, here they sit with Sadok as he passes away. It's a shame you didn't give that opportunity to other people, you monster. Now we could across to the Numenorians and see Muriel trying to practice her paces. Got lots of vibes of the scene in The Great Escape in which they try and pretend Donald Pleasance isn't blind, and Alindiel mentions why he held out Galadriel. Earlier in the season, we learned his name, Olsum and Elfrend, and the pair make a pact together. Now, though it doesn't happen in this finale, sadly, we know what happens with Muriel in the kingdom, and a disability will clearly allow people to manipulate her. They return to find black flags strung up on everything, announcing that the king has sadly passed away. Elsewhere at Oregion, we see that they're now experimenting with the Unseen World, and Halbrand once more provides clear guidance on how to create the rings. At this point, Galadriel reveals that she's actually looked into the whole Halbrand thing, and that, it turns out, that was a f***ing lie. The line of kings in the south is broken, and as we know, Aragorn would come to descend from a lindial in a sealed door. When Halbrand said he took the crest off a dead man, he was being literal, and this entire time, he's played every single situation. Now here, he puts Galadriel in a fantasy with Finrod, in which they discuss his dagger. You might notice that there's two interweaving colours of gold and silver here, which are meant to represent the two trees of Valinor. It's a similar scene to how the opening of the season played out, and in this fantasy he tries to manipulate Galadriel into seeing Sauron wants peace. This will of course be under his rule, and he wants her to touch the darkness once more. He breaks out of this though, and we're transported to the boat. Sauron plays it like he's just a nice guy, but Galadriel sees through the deception and the sweet words. Similar to how Galadriel was tempted with the One Ring in Fellowship, we get him trying to tempt her here. He says the line, I would make you a queen, stronger than the foundations of the earth. Which is a call back to this line said by Galadriel in Fellowship. Said a dark lord, you would have a queen, stronger than the foundations of the earth. Or is it a call forward? I don't know. Now he sees rule as saving people and makes her realise that it's not going to go down well with management when she tells them she saved Sauron. I think this is what stops her from telling people that he's the Dark Lord, and instead she's like, just don't trade with him again. I don't think she gives a strong enough reason for this, but moving on. Now, similar to how she almost drowned in episode 2, she goes back into the water, but here she's saved by Alrond instead of Halbrand. The three rings are then pitched so that they can be balanced, and using Finrod's dagger, they create an alloy for them. Back with the Harfoots, we see as they've started to put plans in place to move on, and learn that the stranger is heading out to Rune. Similar to how Bilbo broke off from the Hobbit's ways and went on an adventure, Nori has decided as well that she wants to go east with him. I think they might potentially end up introducing more wizards next season, and we may see the blue ones, Radagast the Brown, and even Saruman. I thought these goodbyes were the strongest parts of the episode, and we end with a hug from Poppy, who's now put in charge of leading the caravan. I feel like when Nori comes back, she'll find them settled in the Shire, which was known for its safety. It's the opposite side of the map to Mordor, so it's the most likely place that they go in order to get away from everything. Galadriel sacrifices the dagger, and in doing so, she says goodbye to the last thing that her brother owned. This symbolises her quest for revenge being over, and what happens in Mordor stays in Mordor, I guess. However, Elrond does end up discovering the scroll, but it's too late. The elves have now been saved, but they made a deal with the devil in order to do it. The mithril is dropped into the materials, and this creates what looks like the Eye of Sauron before they're finally made. Don't know if I'm reaching, but I also thought this marking looked like the constellation, but again, it might be a reach. Anyway, we end with the Eye of Sauron, calling back to the imagery that we talked about earlier. 
Sauron has ventured out to Mordor, namely Mount Doom, to likely forge the One Ring and take back his land. We then close out to a song, and this sings the words that Tolkien wrote about the creation of the Ring. Next season will likely be Sauron vs. Adar, and he will once more take back his land and go even further to becoming the Dark Lord. And that wraps up the episode, and I thought it was an okay finale that kind of went through the motions that we expected. Obviously we needed the Sauron reveal, the reveal with the stranger, and everything kind of fit into place, so whether you are on board with it to this point, I think is very much going to decide how much you enjoyed it. There are a lot of things that's going to be divisive, like the stranger being Gandalf, but I've been expecting this for a while now and kind of saw it coming, so I I was kind of used to it. I did enjoy the fight that he had, and I am kind of interested to see where they go with him. Also, the Sauron reveal was okay, there were some bits that were a bit clunky, and obviously they went through the whole join me and we can rule this land together speech that is often given by villains to the hero. So it was okay, you know, it delivered on what I thought it would, but I don't think it completely knocked it out of the park. Um, It was just serviceable, if that makes sense. As soon as Halbrand walked in, almost acting like a completely different character, I was like, yeah, I can see where this is going. And not to pat myself on the back, but a lot of theory times turned out to be true, which isn't necessarily always a good thing. Fool of a took. Now as for my thoughts on the series, I think that it's had its ups and downs and provided an uneven ride overall. The road goes ever on and on, and so does the moaning, and though I enjoyed most of the characters, I think that my main faults with the show were down to its pacing and structure. Every time I talk about this, someone inevitably pops up and says that they like slow stories and don't mind the pace at all. That's totally cool, um, and hopefully those people can also understand why that style isn't for everyone. This is something the producers themselves have alluded to, with them saying they try to mimic the long and drawn out world building style of J.R.R. Tolkien. Now I have read and enjoy Tolkien's books and the poetic nature of the work. I think it works well in a book where you can just go at your own pace on stuff, but a TV show is a different format that can falter if you draw things out too much. Longer pacing can work if you're invested in what's going on, but I found the mysteries were too clearly telegraphed for me to wonder about them too deeply. In general, some plots were way more intriguing than others, and Galadriel spent a lot of the season telling people that Sauron was coming. Even after they eventually listened to her, they still had to do things like episode 5, where they prepped all the ships and trained, instead of just getting into the meat. Just give me the meat and give it to me raw, is basically what I'm saying. And because of that, I felt the series got bogged down a bit too much with some of the slower moments. Though the Peter Jackson trilogy has its slow moments too, we have the MacGuffin of the Ring that's driving the plot forward, and also the paranoia that some of our favourite characters could be corrupted. This season didn't really have that, and for a show called Rings of Power, maybe beyond the last episode, we didn't really get that much of a focus on them being created or used. I also think that for newcomers, that there were some things that weren't really explained enough for people to invest themselves into. Morgoth was mentioned heavily in the intro as being the big bad, and then we switched to Sauron without any real explanation to the point that I don't think people who know who these are will even understand why Morgoth was included. Even things like the Balrog's birth gets skipped over, and if you don't know about it being on Earth because the dwarf stuck too deep, then you'd have no idea why it randomly appeared. During the fourth's motives were also really weird, as it's almost like he had this prior knowledge that Balrogs could be found, so he had to stop the digging. The source material says that the Balrog attacked because the dwarves are too greedy. Here though, Durin didn't want to dig too deep for completely unexplained reasons. Just little things like that where I think they could have fleshed out motivations and explanations, and though things like it didn't ruin the show for me, it did bring the score a bit lower. Now, as always, I want to talk about what I like too, so these reviews feel a bit more balanced. Obviously, the visuals and production standard of this are really high, and there was a major feeling of scope and scale throughout the entire season. Bear McCreary did an excellent job of scoring the series, and they definitely have the materials here to do big things in season 2. Though Galadriel is getting a lot of hate online, I'm going to say something controversial, I actually like the arc of her being vengeful over her brother's death, and then having to find a way to navigate out this darkness. Though she was a Karen at points, this was meant to be the point of the character, and Hal Brand very much showed her how you get more bees with honey instead of with vinegar. I think the guy who played Elindil was really good, and watching him being forced into putting his son on the line shows how things are going to progress in the direction of their eventual arcs. For me, the standouts however were the dwarves, and I think that Durin, Disa, and all this stuff with Elrond added a real heart to the show. This cemented the idea that we can find common ground with others, and help them if the opportunity arises. So I like that stuff, I just wish the focus of the series had more interesting things in it. 
I talked about this on a live stream the other day with Greg, John and Ryan and kind of went over how I think the prologue to episode 1 would have been a brilliant first season. They could have done a Game of Thrones thing where we got invested in Finrod as Galadriel's brother, only to see him murder at the end of the season by Sauron who'd go on to get hyped up as a big villain. Instead, this is skipped over in a 5 minute scene and it's a missed opportunity to have our hearts crushed along with Galadriel's. So yeah, that's my thoughts on it, and I think that was probably a misfire to release this alongside House of the Dragon. Though tonally they're different, that has kind of sucked the wind out of Rings of Power's sails, and it's made it so that the shows are directly competing with each other. Whether you agree they should be compared or not, there are the comparisons being made, and it was probably a wrong move to release them running side by side. So yeah, in the end, I did enjoy some parts of Rings of Power, but there was too much in between these moments for this to be as good of a season as it could have been. I think it was Dan Morrill who said reviewing Rings of Power was the Kobayashi Maru of TV shows and that it's a no-win situation and no matter what I say, someone is going to get angry. The weeks I've said I've enjoyed it, I've been called a shill, that's just saying I liked it because Amazon are paying me money. The weeks I've said I've not enjoyed it, I'm a hater and I even had a comment saying that I was being paid by HBO to say Rings of Power was bad. So yeah, you can't win and I'm done. It was fine. In the end, the real Rings of Power was the friends we made along the way. And now I turn it over to you to hear your thoughts on the series. We are in a competition right now and giving away three copies of Thor Love and Thunder on the 15th of October and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random on the 15th and the winners of the last one are on screen right now. So if that's you then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch then make sure you check out one of our House of the Dragon videos which will be linked on screen right now. Loads of stuff to talk about, you're bloody gonna love it, and hopefully I'll see you over there if I haven't annoyed every single person who's watched this video. You take care of yourself, have a good weekend, peace.